so part of what I want to say is that in many senses, everything old is always new again. Um, and the group that I uh, head up at the University of Adelaide, we really focus on looking at consumer trends, not in economic senses or in quantitative senses, such as surveys and so on, but digging that level deeper about why people do what they do. And I think it's particularly critical with food, as we'll see in a minute, with some of the kinds of things I want to run by you. We've seen a number of sort of key trends in recent years that I think are quite likely to continue in the future. But the devil is in the details of what people will mean by those sorts of trends. So for example, we've had this huge increase in so-called ethical food categories. I remember going back nearly 10 years um, trying to pitch a project on ethical food categories and being told by a whole series of reviewers that was meaningless, nobody buys things because it's more ethical and you can see where we are today. Um, these things have changed very, very rapidly. Second, I think we'll continue to see this complex of trade-offs um, and this goes to sort of this point, inconsistent kinds of things, but people see them as consistent. Um, they might do one thing on the weekend and one thing during the week, as was mentioned by Ian. Uh, we often hear from people, they're completely consistent about all things except what they eat for breakfast. At breakfast time, you know, they don't eat seasonal because they always have to have X. Um, so people uh, revel in inconsistency. That's part of what it means probably to be human. Um, and we will continue to see these kinds of trade-offs even where they're not, strictly speaking, logical. And we have to keep this in mind as we think about consumer trends. Um, the third point then is, is that people will continue to use what we call proxy values, and I'll show you a few examples of this in a minute, to guide their food choices. Um, so they may be buying something because of a particular label or a particular category, but that's not necessarily because they believe that label or they believe in that category. It may well be a proxy for something else. And finally, um, segmentation into groups that are pro-technology and those who hold the sort of romantic idealizations of nature that we see often in cooking shows and farm visits and so on will continue to um, coexist. Um, I guess I'm claiming I think these are often two different groups, but I'd also tend to incline with Ian at different moments probably most of us are in both of those groups. Um, and so we hold those values simultaneously and inconsistently. So our group at the University of Adelaide, um, here's a few pictures of some of the research that we've been doing. We try to look at not just why that, what people buy, in other words, trolley inventories or counting product uptake. We try and look at the underlying attitudes and values against the backdrop of personal histories, but also cultural, social histories within communities and within um, different areas. Whole range of kinds of um, food-related issues that we've looked at, including genetic modification, interesting to look at in South Australia, um, gene editing, attitudes towards the grain industry, as I said, ethical food choices, but also things like attitudes towards halal and meat more generally, as well as animal welfare. If we think about food ethics, this is a, this is a chart from you know, an organization that promotes so-called ethical values. You'll see a whole range of kinds of decisions here. But the interesting thing that we found in our research is when we drill down in any one of these categories, um, consumers have very different reasons for buying what appears to be the same thing. Um, so for instance, um, they might well seek out an organic product. That's a really classic example. Um, and at least in our work, qualitatively, um, Concern about the environment comes very down the long down the line in what they mention about why they buy organics. Much more likely they're going to mention a health, particularly children's health, and they're also going to mention nutrition. Now, scientifically, we may not in all cases think that organic products are more nu nutritious. There's different evidence about that. But for the consumers, they equate being organic with being more nutritious. Um, and therefore, for them, that's an important value. That's that kind of proxy value. For all of these sorts of things, which can be construed and are often construed as ethical value categories, I think what we see today is this collision of different values that these categories help to instantiate. Um, what I want to argue is we're going to continue to see that kind of uh, collision of values. And is it really about the ethics? I think what our studies have found is this proxy or value making that occurs with different categories to stand in for other categories is the most powerful driver. So just a couple other kinds of examples. Um, if something is said to have no genetically modified ingredients, that may well not even be a distinction worth a difference. It often occurs, as you probably know, on products for which there's no genetically modified equivalent. Um, but people see that as a mark of being safe, of food safety. Uh, they see it as a mark of big multinationals not being involved. 
Um, they also see it as a mark of something being more what they call natural, which is a very big catch-all for, for a category that many consumers are interested in. As I mentioned, organic a minute ago is also seen as more natural in some sense. And finally, local is a huge basket of values that are combined many of which may be counterintuitive, at least to you, depending on whether you buy local and why you buy it. Um, many of the consumers who we've interviewed and worked with say they buy local because it's convenient, because it's up at the corner. And when they do that, they're buying at perhaps one of the duopolies that happens to be at the corner. For them, that's local. Um, people in Australia tolerate a lot longer transport of goods than they might, for example, in the EU or in North America, because we know our um, fruit and veg and other things come very long distances oftentimes. They don't necessarily mean it's equivalent to a 100 mile or 100 kilometer radius. Um, so local comes to mean a whole range of other values. People do rely on these categories as a shorthand. We're all in, in a hurry. We have got screaming kids in the trolley. We've got to get our shopping done, whatever it is. So these categories have a very important role, but they're dangerous, and, you know, particularly for retailers, producers, and so on, because you need to be on top of what it might be that these consumers are thinking that label is conveying to them. And that's a whole bundle of things that we have yet to unpack. Trust deeply entwined, and Emma's going to talk about trust in a minute. But the narratives and stories, this got mentioned in the previous session as well, are also critical to the ways in which those labels get constructed. Finally, I think a lot of our studies have found that there are, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's lots of negative associations, particularly with things that are made using science or made using technology. It may not even be very high-tech technology by our standards, but to consumers, this sort of, for them, is scary in many ways. So I've got a couple quotes from our participants. I simply wouldn't buy GM. It's because I don't know much about it, and it's scary. Um, I associate it with not being good for me. I don't know why, that's just how it is. But what we found when we then drilled down in conversation, it's a little bit less about this, this kind of ridiculous image, which obviously isn't really GM, but it's a shorthand, and more about fears about um, large-scale kind of farming uh, and also large-scale multinational retailers, but also multinational food corporations and so on. Um, that GM opposition is as much about that kind of pushback as it is about the science. Preferences for organic foods, um, even if they're more expensive, they're less risky. Um, most people buy them because they're so-called chemical-free, and again, the evidence is, is differential about that, depending on what you mean a chemical is. Um, and natural food products in general have a lot of traction these days. Local is valued, is also a proxy for healthier, uh, more nutritious food, and is a way to control risk and get safer food. So again, a quote from our participants. If we'd only asked, do you buy local, this person would have said yes. And we would have thought, oh, she does that to help out local farmers. She does that because she's interested in um, food miles, carbon emissions, whatever. But she goes on to say, I only buy local. Well, I buy local fish, she clarified. Why? I'm quite concerned about the amount of chemicals in the water, especially around Asia and northern Australia. I buy the fish that swim in the bite. And all of a sudden, you get all these intertangled values that otherwise, in a survey or a poll, might have remained invisible. Um, and what she turned out to be very concerned about was pollution, her own health, her kids' health, and a certain kind of bias against products that are coming from outside Australia as not being as clean. Um, it had very little to do with perhaps what we normally think of as local. Um, what we're seeing in a lot of our studies, and I, this would be really interesting to talk about more generally with the group, is as much as it probably is a good idea to promote Australian food and what's valued with that, both domestically and abroad, in turn, this brings up all sorts of nationalistic, or dare I say even xenophobic, kinds of uh, responses and tendencies. And so we get a lot of people saying, I avoid certain sorts of products from certain sorts of places because we know it's not as clean, it's not as good, um, and here I draw a line in the sand, I buy Australian. Um, and so I think very scares, think frozen berries, pick your favorite recent scare, have pushed people to buy local. But in turn, this has also pushed them to have certain sorts of ideas about why local is valued that is so complex that we could possibly violate the trust that we have uh, if we don't um, uh, reinforce that actually there's a complex of things they're doing when they buy local. So as much as I like this idea about labeling you know, the truly Australian product, what we're hearing is the labeling, at least now, as we all know, is not sufficient, it's confusing, it seems to be deceptive. What does it even mean to be 70% 
what does this tell me as the busy consumer about what I should be buying? What is good? And with the increase of these sorts of labels that are very clear and very accurate, on the one hand, comes a lack of trust because it seems as though there's a hedging. What about the 30%? And uh, just a few quotes here, but I won't read them. Many of the people in our research say, I've given up. Don't even read the labels. I find someone I trust. It'll be the butcher. It'll be the guy next door whose sister will bring home something. Um, whatever country it's imported from, I don't trust it. I build on relationships. And this may be fine if you have lots of time and, frankly, lots of money. But I think it presents a conflict for other people with less time, less money, um, because they can't rely on those sorts of relationships. This, in turn, makes them think they're buying bad food. And that's a bad message to be getting across. We want people to be confident and trusting in their food supply. So in summary, my sort of predictions for the future are these complications and confusions are going to remain. Um, and for all of us who work in different parts of the food-related and agriculture-related sector, we have to be much more conscious of the fact that these mixed messages are out there and that consumers, they have to buy something, they have to eat something, but they're confused, they're overwhelmed, they don't necessarily think they're being done right by in the way that products are being presented to them. We need to think about those underlying values. Why is it that people are buying local? They may well be racist. They think products from elsewhere are just plain dirty. Okay, what do we do about that? How do we work with that? That may or may not be a thing that we want to be fostering. Second point I want to say is that um, there's a well-known model called the deficit model um, in science communication and other things, which says you can't just fix things by educating people more. And I think food is a primary domain and agriculture as well. You can tell them all about processes and products and so on, but at the end of the day, people want a shorthand rule of thumb. And that's why they're using labels like organic or local or whatever, because it's an easy shorthand. Um, therefore, more generally, they're not going to learn all the details. Nutritional labeling is overwhelming for most people, as a good example. So instead, we really need to go back to transparency and trust. We need to think about these trade-offs that our people are making all the time, and how then to fit new products and new approaches in with this trade-off making calculus that people are often engaged in. Finally, I think we need to think harder about having higher level engagement with consumers around the values. What is valued? Is it true that people are just simply opposed to GM? That's what we hear in South Australia. I, I guess the other states you know, aren't part of the same country we are. Not really sure um, how this all shakes down. But I think underneath all of those things, there's a reality about differences in values, differences in what counts as evidence and beliefs about how these things fit different kinds of trade-offs, including export, including economic reasons, and so on. And finally, the future is the past repeated again, but with a new sort of articulation. And what I think we need to do is think harder about where we've come from and why we've come through that past in order to make the, the uh, future better uh, for everyone. So some quick acknowledgments. Thank you.